Well, good morning again, church family. It is my privilege and pleasure to bring God's word to you this morning. Um, it, is, it is a joy to join you on the Lord's Day. I just want to say thanks for joining us in person and online. If you're joining us online um, and you have significant health issues or you're homebound and you can't come out here as I prayed, um, that you would just know that you're loved by your church family, that you are missed by your church family, uh, that you would feel God's care and presence. And conversely, if you're this morning watching online and you're not staying away because you're sick or homebound, you need to know that your church family misses you. You need to know also that you are dearly loved, but watching online is no substitute for participating in the body of Christ. Church online is not, in fact, church. So because we love you, I want you to know that if you went to baseball practice yesterday or a track meet or wherever, and you had a long day in the garden and you're just happening to be at home, As we dig into our text this morning, I'm convinced of the reality that you, by not being here, are robbing your church family of the blessing of your spiritual gifts to us. Not being here face to face to be encouraged by your presence, you need to know you're dearly loved and you're dearly missed. So come and join us if you're watching us online. And if you can't join us, for lots of reasons, health and otherwise, know that we miss you. Uh, listen, this morning's passage is about spiritual gifts. Um, I don't know if you know this about spiritual gifts, but there's kind of a little bit of a controversy around it. If you've been around church any number of years, really possibly any number of weeks, you, you might come across the fact that when it comes to spiritual gifts, people have differing opinions about it. Um, so as we get stuck into our text this morning, I want to encourage you with a couple of things. First, let's, let's read our text this morning. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. It says this, Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray by mute idols, however you were led. And therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. To another, the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by the one spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, the ability to distinguish between spirits. To another, various kinds of tongues. And to another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Would you pray briefly with me for our time in the word this morning? Father, you in your goodness and your grace have given us gifts by your spirit to be equipped to build up the church and to bring your kingdom into this world until the day you return. So Father, as we study through these passages, I ask that you would use by the spirit of God, the word of God, to reveal to us the son of God, all for the glory of God. In your name, amen. So our passage this morning is about spiritual gifts. We're going to be digging in over the next few weeks, specifically, as I said two weeks ago, into chapters 12, 13, and 14. And they often are kind of separated when you think about individual places where people pull their verses theologically on what they think about spiritual gifts. But really, it's very important to take 12, 13, and 14 collectively as a whole. That's what we talked about two weeks ago. It certainly elicits a lot of debates and opinions. It seems over the years there's been a lot of debate about what these spiritual gifts are. I want to tell you first and foremost, while that's important and I promise we will get there through a lot of the text as we dig into 12, 13, and 14, it's also really important to acknowledge there is a forest here 
rather than individual trees, right? There is a forest of God's good gifts to his church. And oftentimes we make the mistake of wanting to highlight one particular amazing redwood tree or the, the most wonderful oak you've ever seen or the most beautiful Christmas looking pine, right? Like, like there's these really, really special trees and then there's just the forest. And, and scripture just doesn't seem to present that. Our passage this morning, I believe, is actually really about stewardship and service in the local church. It's, it's really about gospel-bound love for one another and for the lost bearing itself out in the community of the church. That's what I hope to dig into with you this morning. But before we get into it this morning, I want to give you potentially three common areas that we tend to or are tempted to often give in when we think about spiritual gifts. The, the reality is it's probably far more than three, but I think these are the three most prevalent that we need to be careful of. My prayer is that they function as a bit of a warning for us. The first is envy or discontent with the gift that you are given. It's really easy to, to look at someone else's gifting and, and by extension look at yourself and be like, well, I'm not gifted that way. And therefore, there's an immediate, it's the iPhone syndrome, right? Well, you've got the brand new iPhone, the really fancy schmancy one with the huge massive screen or the new this, that, or the other. It's an immediate compare and contrast that actually really comes from a heart of entitlement and envy. And we have to be careful of it because it will, it will instill in us discontent. And friends, discontent is like a spiritual poison, the second error that we often are prone to is selfishness or laziness when it comes to using our gifts. What I mean is, if you don't steward the gift that you are given well, you have to be careful that God might not remove it from you. Oftentimes, I think some of us are in danger of being like the man in the parable of the talents that went and buried the treasure that he was given, instead of investing it, instead of growing it, instead of building it, we throw it in the ground. Now, it's safe there, but it's not doing anyone any good, right? We can bury God's gracious gifts in the ground if we're not careful. They're not certainly then being used to accomplish God's purposes in the earth. What it is, is it's actually a, a version of selfishness and laziness. I don't want to do this, or functionally, maybe I don't want to be used in that way. Sometimes it's, you hear pastors talk about, it's just going out of your comfort zone. Maybe that is the thing. Sometimes God gifts us in ways or calls us and equips us in ways that we're very uncomfortable with. And it's okay to be called out of your comfort zone. That's not necessarily what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a lack of desire to use that which you've been given by the Lord to serve the church with. A third error in this is, is foolishness or, or really even sinfulness, using the gifts that God gave you, but for the wrong reasons. So instead of just taking your gift and stuffing it in the ground, it's using it so that the gift focuses on you. And you see this in loads of, of certain places, especially, and I'm not, and this is, this is not a broad brush statement, the question that you should ask for someone who wants to constantly talk about speaking in tongues is, is the gift about bringing honor and glory to the Lord or about the person desiring to stand up and speak in tongues? I'm not saying that everyone who wants to speak in tongues is desirous of the looking at them. That's not my point. Don't hear that at all. But that in every case, any gift can be used to bring worship to us and cloud worship of God. Any of us up here, in any measurable way, that's why the stage is so dangerous, by the way, just so you know. I wish so often that we could just be down here. I know some of you feel the same. Because there's a reality, right, where a platform of any kind is dangerous because it focuses on a person and not on a savior. So with those specific errors noted, let's get to the main point. I think 
really the heart of our passage this morning, and that's this. We're called to use our God-given spiritual gifts to serve others and build up the church. Use your God-given gifts to serve others and build up the church. And as we dig into our text this morning, I have just three very simple points for us to consider in these verses. They're this. We have unity in confession. That's verses 1 through 3. Unity in confession. Verses 4 through 10, we have unity through expression. And in verse 11, unity in commission. Unity in confession, unity through expression, and unity in commission. The first comes from verses 1 through 3, and it's this. The Holy Spirit seemingly enables and enlightens us to confess Jesus as Lord. And there's a reality here. All genuine Christians are gifted by the Holy Spirit to know and proclaim Jesus. Ultimately, this is our first and foremost spiritual gift. It's the most important one there is. Paul writes in verse 1, he says, Now concerning what, now, concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I don't want you to be uninformed. What he's really saying is, he's changing to a new topic. If you recall, there's a lot of now concernings in, in Paul's letters. Now concerning lawsuits. Now concerning the husband who was sleeping with his wife. Now concerning divisions among you. Now concerning philosophy. Now concerning this, that, and the other. And functionally, it's, it's evidence that he's answering a question from something that they asked him. And we don't have what that question is. But in this case, it's clearly regarding some version of spiritual gifts. So he says, all right, let's talk about it. It's probably in regards to some questions they asked in their earlier letter. He says, I don't want you to be uninformed. I don't want you to not know what's going on here. So he sets about addressing their questions, but probably not in the way they immediately expected. And the thing that's really important to note as we go forward, the Corinthians had very likely asked about specific gifts of prophecy, speaking in tongues, and perhaps other miraculous gifts. You see that because he spends so much time in 12 and 14 delineating out the specifics of what that looks like and why. But first, what he does is push back a little bit can sort of see what's going on in their questions, really. Remember, the Corinthians themselves, they're coming from paganism. That's ultimately Babylonian mysticism. Whether it's Baal or Asherah, Ashtaroth, Ishtar, Osiris, Zeus, etc., ultimately, you can trace the paganism of the various nations in and around Israel and the religious systems that they promote all the way back to the Tower of Babel. In almost all cases, they somehow form these ideas about these ecstatic utterances, this speaking in tongues idea, communing with the divine. And it's interesting to note that really what they're trying to do is use magic, emotion, music, hallucinogenic drugs, likely, to commune with the divine and ultimately bend the will of their particular God. In all these specific religious systems, it's about control. They're seeking to use these things to control their God. And then here comes Paul suggesting that you can't control the spirit. It's actually, in fact, wild and very untamed, and you've got to be careful. So he's, he's giving them these, these kind of bumpers, these spiritual guide rails to sit within. You recall the interaction between Lucy and Mr. Beaver in the Chronicles of Narnia, right? When confronted with the idea of Aslan the lion, who is a picture of God in that scenario, Lucy asks, well, is he safe? And what does Beaver respond? Safe? Of course he's not safe. Who said anything about safe, right? But what does he say? But he is good. Mr. Tumnus jumps through the same thing. He says he is good. He's the king. He's wild, you know. He's not a tame lion. See, the the Spirit gifts differently. He empowers believers uniquely. And it's going to be important for the Corinthians to distinguish the real from the fake. But later in chapter 14, he says, We serve a God of peace and order, not of chaos and confusion. 
So they likely have some specific questions as it relates to those more miraculous things. Miracles, healing, speaking in tongues. Because yet again, they were divided. They believed that these things meant that they were more spiritual. If you could speak in tongues, if you could heal, if you could uh, do miracles, you were clearly more spiritual than those who couldn't. And what's going on? They're setting up yet again another class system of Christian. Well, you're this class of Christian, but, but I have the gift of healing. You're that class of Christian, but I have the gift of prophecy. And Paul's at this point, I think, probably getting really tired of the created divisions. Yet again, he's seeking to unite them. So right here at the start of our passage, he ends up answering the questions by talking about the most important of spiritual gifts. What's the most important spiritual gift that we have? The one that we all have in common. It's actually verses 1 through 3. We are united in our confession. What do we confess? We confess that Jesus is Lord. Right? That's Romans 10. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God saved him from the dead, you will be saved. It's that simple. It's belief and faith in Christ to know and confess Christ as Lord. Where does that originate from? Does it originate from you? No. You were dead in your sins, right? So what can dead people do? Dead people can do a lot of nothing. God had to act to open your eyes to hear and believe the gospel. If you're a Christian today, the greatest spiritual gift you will ever receive is the gift of salvation. Amen? The gift is faith in Christ. If you're a Christian this morning, the greatest miracle that ever occurred in your life is not that you've been healed from cancer or reunited with your spouse. It's not that you prayed for somebody else and they were miraculously healed. Those are wonderful things. But brothers and sisters, the greatest miracle in your life is that you were saved from death into everlasting life if you've believed and placed your faith in Christ. That's the greatest thing that will ever occur in your life. If you have not place your faith in Christ, I would plead that you make today that day, that you hear and believe the gospel, and that you understand and repent of your sins. You were brought from darkness to light. You were far off, but by the blood of Christ, you've been brought near. That's the gospel that we've proclaimed, brothers and sisters, that Christ lived perfectly, never sinned, and died for your sins and mine as a payment for our sins, that he was buried and that he was raised to life three days later, showing his power over sin and death, and that he appeared and resurrected, formed to over 500, and then he ascended into heaven where we wait for him to return. That is the miracle of the gospel. And quite honestly, before anything else in our, in our text this morning, that's the greatest miracle that you will find in all of Scripture. Verses 2 and 3 of our text, he says, You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. To me, it's interesting to note that they seem to ask a question about speaking in tongues, and Paul says they were led astray by mute idols. Muteness implies they can't speak. There's just some irony there in the original language when you see what's going on in the text. He's almost making fun of their question, not quite sarcastically as Paul normally is with a little slap across the face, but... You asked about speaking in tongues, and he said you were led away to mute idols that cannot speak and are completely impotent to do anything. I want you to understand from the start, Paul says, the gift of knowing Jesus is Lord and having faith in him is the most important spiritual gift. You proclaim Jesus is Lord because the Holy Spirit did something in your heart, in my heart. That's why we can say Jesus is Lord. They need to be reminded of it. We need to be reminded of it. Confessing and having faith in Jesus is a gift of the Spirit. We can pray for it, we can receive it, but we didn't earn it, nor did we achieve it. It was very lovingly given to you by a God who so desperately loved you, who is jealous for his own glory, that he desires to save those who would call upon Christ. Other spiritual gifts are very, very important, but they are secondary and complementary to 
this gift of salvation. Here's what's going on. Paul gives us this twofold test in verse 3. He says, negatively, no person led by the Spirit can curse Jesus or consider him accursed because he was crucified. What he means is a genuine Christian doesn't judge Jesus or look at the cross of Jesus with disdain or horror, but rather we look at the cross in awe and worship with gratitudes in our heart for what Christ accomplished for us. The cross is where we lay our burdens down. It's where, by faith, we receive our sight. We know Jesus isn't accursed. He willingly went to the cross. Christ willingly gave up his life for you and for me. On the positive side, Paul says, only by the Spirit can a person testify that Jesus is Lord. Right? Anybody can say the words. Anybody can say, Jesus is Lord. But only by the Spirit's work in them can they genuinely confess Christ is Lord. In verses 4 through 10, we see that the Holy Spirit gives all believers a variety of spiritual gifts. It's our second point this morning. Unity through expression. We are unified through our expressions, various, individual, and different in the ways that God has gifted his church. My gifts are different than your gifts. Praise ye the Lord. Each and every believer is spiritually gifted. We, the church, have received this incredible diversity, this thing that we should celebrate of spiritual gifts from the Lord. Paul writes in verses 4 through 6, Now there are a variety... There are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service or ministries, but the same Lord. There are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all and everyone. Notice the parallelism, the repetitiveness, even a little bit of the work of the Trinity that you've got going on here. Not that one individual piece of the Trinity is just responsible for this, that, and the other. It's not just workings, miracles, healings. That would be partialism. That's quite a heresy that's been disproved back in the 500s, just to be clear. But, but he's, he's talking in ways that you hear the language, that there is the same spirit that empowers, but he uses God, Lord, and spirit twice in our passage. It's reminding yet again of the unity in the giving of these gifts. These gifts are going to be expressed differently in the life of the church, but what we should be doing is responding in praise to God for all that generosity and all the diversity of gifts. And despite what we're tempted to believe, that some gifts are better than others, in fact, we're tempted yet again to control the spirit, to envy other people's gifts, to look highly on more people's gifts than others, just like the Corinthians are. It's very easy to look at people that are gifted in certain ways and say they're clearly more spiritual. Like, you would be prone, I would be prone, I think, if, like, if Chris just, like, walked up and prayed for somebody to be healed, and, like, that happened 30 times, and they were all healed, praise the Lord for his outpouring of the Spirit, but you'd be inclined to think that Chris has some especially unique connection to the Spirit. And the Scripture says that's not the case. It's easy to look more highly on one gift than another. I want you to hear really clearly on this. One gift, one expression of this gift is not more important or better than another. Why? Because they all come from the same God. Because they're given by the same Spirit. So, in fact, all gifts and service are valuable. Why? Because of the God who gives them their value. Yes, they're different. They do vary. Different gifts have different purposes and different expressions. Just like your liver and your kidneys and your lungs and your brain and my heart all do different things to keep us alive. But you could not survive without any one of them. Maybe a pancreas or two. You could lose a kidney here and there. Somebody's walking around with one lung. I feel like it all the time. But in fact, you need them all. Isn't that actually comforting? Aren't you glad that, like... We're different there, made differently, gifted differently. We can serve differently. Some of you would be terrified to do this. I'm terrified to do this, but for different reasons. Our God knows what his church needs. So in his grace, he gifts us uniquely 
and differently, a diversity and expression of gifts. What would the church look like if we were all gifted the same, right? What if everyone was exactly like you? That's like my worst nightmare. Like a whole bunch of like mostly bald, slightly pudgy people just running around being like, theology is great. You need less of me in the world, just so you know. Some of you are like, exactly, that's what I want. A church where everybody looks like me, believes exactly like me. No, my friend, that's a cult. What if no one was like you? Conversely, well, that's not fun either, right? To look around and go, I have nothing in common with these people. Some of you are sitting here right now, you're looking left and right, and you're like, I have nothing in common with these people. You're like, no, this is definitely not what heaven's going to look like. May, may I encourage you, this is exactly what heaven's going to look like, only there's going to be all the more diversity in every way you can have diversity, and praise the Lord for that. You have been gifted Christ the Lord in common if you have confessed Christ. You have been given spiritual gifts in common to serve one another and to build the church and to reach the lost with the hope of the gospel. You've all been given the Holy Spirit in common. Those are things that you have in common with people that you look across the aisle and go, I got nothing in common with that guy or girl. In other words, you have the Holy Spirit who empowers all believers. You have the same Spirit God has made us different, in fact, that he might make us one, he'll tell me. The gifts show us that we are a puzzle made up of very different pieces, and yet when we exercise our gifts within the local context, we find that we serve together perfectly and create a beautiful representation of God's family that will not be seen other than in the church, globally and locally, this side of heaven. That is something to rejoice in, my friends, you can rejoice in a lot of things. You can rejoice in the church families that we have. right? You can rejoice that we have a healthy church. A healthy church, however, isn't just good at preaching and corporate worship. It's not having good leaders and good practices and good policies. Those are all really good things. But a healthy church is not just about having an awesome building and a big missions budget. Just so we're clear. I'm glad we have a great building. I'm glad we have a very, very healthy missions budget. That's a wonderful thing to praise the Lord for. But that is not what's important. Don't miss this. A healthy church is every single member of that church using their gifts together in unity for the glory of God. That's what a healthy church looks like. That's who we are, and that's who I hope that we will continue to be. Brings us to our last point. We are unified in the same spirit. We are unified in our commission. Why are we unified in the same spirit? We're unified to be used for the building up of God's church so that we can proclaim Christ both to one another and equip and encourage each other and to proclaim Christ to the lost. That is our commission. We're gifted to do that. Spiritual gifts serve so that we can do that. Verses 7 through 11 kind of bring matters to a close here. They form bookends to the last part of our passage. Let me read them. Verse 7 says, To each is given a manifestation of the Spirit. Why? It says, For the common good, so that the church would be built up. And then verse 11, all these gifts are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. So we have here in verses 7 and verse 11, this bookend right through verses 8 through 10 where he talks about these specific gifts. Right? We have the heart of the passage where Paul says each and every believer is given spiritual gifts. Maybe one, maybe more, maybe they're for a time, maybe they're for your whole life, maybe they're just for a specific task. You see that throughout the New Testament as well. I would like to say you see that through even the modern church. These are, are manifestations of the Spirit, Paul says. They're for the common good of the church. What they are ultimately are gifts from God to us, you and I, for his church and for his glory. That's why spiritual gifts 
exist. To equip one another, to equip the church, to equip the lost, to bring glory to God. It isn't just a select elite of those who have been given more noteworthy or spectacular gifts to be more spiritually gifted. It's for every believer, for the entire church, and for God's glory. And then we see in verses 8 through 10, maybe the part of the sermon that everybody's kind of specifically waiting for, nine specific spiritual gifts. A couple of notes right up front, right? It's not intended in any way here to be exhaustive. This is not an exhaustive list. He's not trying to cover all the possible spiritual gifts that exist. He does list nine very important ones. But actually, it complements other lists that we find in Romans 12, Ephesians 4. We find chapter 12 in our text in Corinthians, and then we find a whole lot in Corinthians 14. And we need to look at all these lists together to get a more complete list or understanding of spiritual gifts. One of the reasons I think there's so many varying gifts and so much kind of vagueness around them is because Paul was never looking to give an exhaustive specific list of every possible permutation of spiritual gift. It's also worth noting that like a lot of people want the gift of evangelism or they want the gift of miracles or healing or speaking in tongues. Some people don't really seem to value the spiritual gift of administration. Like, meh, yeah, there you go. right, right, you've got a spiritual gift. The spiritual gift of hospitality, which is an, in fact, wonderful thing. And yet, well, right, right, we can be hospitable. We're all called to be hospitable. Some of you, in every church this exists, it's not just at Hilltown, this is every church that's ever been created since the dawn of the church. Some of you believe that you have the spiritual gift of criticism. <laughs> Might I convince you you don't? It's just not in the list. It shows up a lot of places, but it's not in the list of Scripture and their spiritual gifts. So if you believe that you have the spiritual gift of criticism and want to define it as, I have the spiritual gift of helps, H-E-L-P-S, just in case my southern draw mess with you, helps. It's not the same thing. Anyway, let's take them together. The first two kind of go together, wisdom and knowledge. Paul writes, for to one is given through the Spirit. Again, he says, the Spirit is at work here. For one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge, according to the same Spirit. I believe briefly, wisdom is applying and speaking God's wisdom and the principles of God's Word in very practical ways in specific situations. Then you get the miraculous gifts, they're there in verses 9 to the beginning of 10. He says, to another, faith by the same spirit. To another, gifts of healing by one spirit. And to another, the working of miracles. Again, some quick definitions. We'll dig into these in future weeks. Faith here is not simply understood as saving faith. We all have saving faith. If you've believed in Christ, you have been given saving faith, salvific faith. This seems to be a special measure of faith. For those of you who are like 65 and older, you might use the term a special dispensation of God's grace for those that are inclined to think in those terms. I figured that would go over better than it did. Oh, well, who knew? I'm thrilled that we're just past that conversation, though. That's wonderful. Anyway, faith here is not just saving faith. It's not one-time faith, but in fact, specific faith in a specific task. Sometimes you can see this specific gift of faith. Have you ever seen somebody that just like, their life is just one like hard thing after another, after another, after another, and you're like, how do they still believe in God? Because like, I kind of feel like they're like Job right now. This went and this went and this happened and this happened. And you're just in marvel of their faith. I do believe that's probably an, an extra gift of faith to that person. That is God's goodness to the church, that when difficult times come, somebody can rise up under the measure, shore up under faith. Sometimes this specific measure of faith also occurs in persecution, where you're like, never would I want that. And yet, if that happened to you, or as we hear across the, the world in global missions, God does some incredible things through believers who have exercised great faith 
among incredibly difficult circumstances. Persecution, murder, marginalization, right? Like not just cultural marginalization like our, like our country's under, but, but active persecution. And the church bears up in faith. Then you get healing. It's being used by God somehow through the Holy Spirit to restore health to those with physical, emotional, and spiritual illness. Miracles are being used by God to accomplish acts that manifest the supernatural presence and power of God. We will talk in other weeks, not this week, about what those are, why those are, and where we stand on miraculous gifts. But That's not the point of today. So those three kind of go together. And then we have prophecy and discernment. And we keep going through verse 10 to another is given prophecy and to another the ability to distinguish between spirits. This is speaking of God's wisdom to his people for their warning, edification, encouragement, instruction, speaking a word of encouragement or building up believers or to convict unbelievers of sin. That's what happens in chapter 14. And to draw them into faith in God. That's prophecy. And then discernment, being able to distinguish truth from error, to see what is authentic from what is counterfeit. What's holy versus unholy, sound doctrine versus false teaching, spiritual versus carnal, if you remember in 1 Corinthians 3, even discerning what is good versus what is evil. That comes with discernment, and discernment is a gift of the Spirit. This gift is needed for the testing of prophecy. I would also argue that significant discernment is needed for the testing of other miraculous gifts. And then finally, the big one, the one that splits entire denominations, speaking in an unknown tongue, an interpretation or translation of that unknown tongue. Paul writes, to another, various kinds of tongues, and to another, the interpretation of the tongues. Notice two things. He puts these last and together. As a reminder, we'll get more on this later, but speaking in an unknown tongue, as I understand it, and as many commentators would agree, Basically, the ability to pray to God or speak to people in a language never learned by the individual with that gift, an unknown language. We'll get into specifics of that later. The term used in Greek is glossolalia. It sounds like you're speaking in tongues. But they are known languages, it would seem, from all the commentaries, both liberal and conservative, that I've gone through. You can't get around the way that's translated. And then the interpretation is the ability to interpret or translate a message publicly uttered in a tongue, in a language not understood those, by those who are in the church. That's a particularly helpful and important thing for orderly worship we'll get into in chapter 14. But that's the nine. That's just a really quick overview of the nine that are there, but hopefully you at least get a thumbnail sketch of them. But remember, he finishes with our final point this morning. Unity in commission. We're unified in our commission, our empowering by the Spirit for the building up of God's church and God's kingdom. All of these are empowered by the same Spirit. So two final implications, and I'll draw us to a close, and we'll take the Lord's Supper together. First is this, credit. Where does the credit for these things go to? The credit for the gifts belongs solely to the Spirit. No gift and no spiritual gift is evident for, of spiritual accomplishment. If you have a gift of this, that, or the other, it's not because you've spiritually accomplished something significant. It is a gift from God the Father through the work of the Holy Spirit to equip the church and the lost to see and savor Christ. They belong solely to the Spirit. So much like Ephesians 2, you can't boast in your faith because you didn't produce it. In the same way, you shouldn't boast in your spiritual gift. Because it's not about you. Secondly, no Christian has ever had all or even oftentimes very many of these gifts. And it certainly makes you not more spiritual than another. The Spirit works in every single Christian to ensure that there will be a gift in the church. The diversity of gifts in the church. But ultimately... Those gifts are given to bring about unity in the same spirit. So what? What should we do with all of that? Well, I would suggest a couple of things. We should humbly give thanks. We should humbly give thanks and praise God that the spirit gave us the gift of faith. To understand 
and to believe the gospel and to proclaim Jesus as Lord. That's a gift. What a gift. You've heard the gospel and believed the gospel because God allowed someone to share the gospel with you. And he opened your eyes and your hearts to see and believe it. We are united in our confession that Jesus is Lord. And also, we should humbly give thanks and praise God for all the gifts the Spirit has given us. Not just for the flashy and the public and the popular ones. We're unified through the diversity of God's gifting. And that should prompt us to worship the giver of all gifts. That should allow us to humbly bow our knees in worship and praise to the one who not just gives us faith, but who graciously gives us all things. And we are now called to develop and to use our spiritual gifts to serve God and to serve others. Hilltown, your gift is not for you. God gave them to you so that you would share them with the church. Finally, let's remember that we are united in commission. We are united in our mission to use these spiritual gifts that God so graciously gave us for the building up of the church and the ushering in of God's kingdom through the preaching of the gospel until the day he returns in glory. We're united in confession, united through expression, and united in commission because we are united, brothers and sisters, by the very same spirit of God. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the way in which you have gifted the church. Lord, your love for us is demonstrated certainly and foremost through Christ's death on the cross for us. But Lord, you did not stop there. You brought Christ, ascended into glory so that you could send the Spirit to equip your church. Father, we thank you for the gifts of the Spirit. We pray that as we study over the next several weeks, Lord, that you would cause unity and not division and distraction, but Father, you would cause us to worship the giver of all gifts. We ask these things in your name. Amen.